old books and manuscripts, worn pages, hard to decipher handwriting, sepia tone photographs, names all but lost to the ages, mementos, relics, and memorabilia frozen in time, shelves and more shelves, history held in trust, in archives. It's not just about a lifeless past, it's our story. It's living history. One of the great contributors to the history of the English uh, Bible was Charles Wesley, one of the early founders uh, of Methodism. And we have here two wonderful manuscript items connected to Wesley and his translation of the Psalms. Manuscript items tracing early Methodism, plus various versions of the Bible, including, of course, a King James translation, and more surprisingly, a wicked version. These count among the finds that make up one of the major exhibitions of the Pitts Theology Library at Emory University's Candler School of Theology. One of the great benefits of moving into this new building five years ago is the physical exhibition space that we have. So it's a 1,200 square foot gallery with 22 cases that allow, allows us to curate and display some of these wonderful items that are here in the collection. We typically uh, put on about three exhibitions a year. And these are generally curated from within uh, by our staff as well as by scholars from the university and much more broadly. Typically our exhibitions feature our collections, but we've done a lot of collaboration with local collectors or other institutions to use the gallery to tell a full story of whatever topic it is that we're exploring. We also use the gallery to highlight some of the real gems of our collection, the ability to show, though our special collections is broad in its scope, there are a few areas where we really dig deep and really are trying to um, generate impressive collections. Richard Bo Manley Adams Jr. is director of the Pitts Theology Library at Emory University's Candler School of Theology. Adams takes us on a journey through time with a look at the library's exhibition that covers the history of the English Bible. The title, Word for Word, Sense for Sense, The English Bible in History and Worship. It's a display that shows examples of how the Bible in English has changed over 500 years since its first translation and subsequent printing. So this is an exhibition of the history of the Bible in English. And really the printed Bible in English begins here with the figure William Tyndall, who was born at the end of the 15th century and is credited with the first English translation of the New Testament in a printed version. What we have here is a parallel Bible. Uh, on the one side you have uh, Tyndall's English translation, and on the other side you have uh, Erasmus of Rotterdam's Latin translation. And it was Erat Erasmus's Greek Bible that Tyndall used to construct uh, his first English New Testament printed in 1526. The gallery as a whole tells the story from Tyndall all the way forward to contemporary times, showing the many ways in which the translation of the English Bible has changed over the centuries, reflecting cultural, religious, and social changes, as well as the development of new technologies. That 1526 printing of the Bible in English predates a more popular version, one that many may think made for the Bible's first translation. Many of us, when we think about the English Bible, think about the King James Version, which of course has been the most influential translation of the Bible into English in the history of the church. The King James, of course, though, was a later English translation. There were several printed English Bibles before the King James. And in many ways, the King James, which was produced in 1611, was the product of this diversity of translations, in that King James himself wanted a more stable, central translation for the Church of England. And so, in the early 17th century, he convened the largest group of translators that had ever gotten together to produce an English Bible, and in 1611, produced the King James Version, which is significant not only as a Bible, but as a centralizing force uh, for our modern English language. We have on display here in the gallery a first edition and first printing of the King James, as well as many later uh, editions of the King James as the text continued to change and be revised over the centuries. And in keeping with the King James Version, the exhibit features somewhat of a twist on that translation. So what we have here uh, is a 1631 printing of the King James Bible, which is known as the Wicked Bible. Now the printing of the Bible is of course a, a human endeavor, uh, and therefore it's prone to lots of mistakes. 
Um, this is a very famous mistake made uh, in the 1631 printing. Here we see in the printing of Exodus 20, uh, which is the traditional listing of the Ten Commandments, the Seventh Commandment, an important word is left out, and it reads, Thou shalt commit adultery. This, of course, uh, was very scandalous and controversial at the time. Uh, King Charles I was unhappy. Uh, he ordered that all of these texts be burned, uh, and he ordered the printers be brought before him, and they were levied with a very heavy fine. Uh, all of the texts were burned with the exception of a few, uh, and this is one of the few uh, examples that still remains today. Since that time, it's been more common than not to find a different take on the Bible. One of the developments in the late 20th and early 21st century has been the explosion in the number of Bibles that are being produced. A real proliferation, not only in terms of how the Bible's translated, but the form in which we find the Bible. So here you see a number of examples of different shapes and genres of Bible. For example, you see uh, comic book Bibles, you see children's Bibles with sports balls on the bindings, you see a Bible for the liberal, you see the amplified Bible, an attempt to kind of bring the Bible to all of the various types of people that are out there. And what you see is no longer is the translator simply driving the form of the Bible, but the reader and the anticipated readership is really changing the ways in which the Bible is presented. This, of course, has had deep influence on the way that the English language is actually rendered, as people have attempted to be more and more specific and to translate the Bible into narrower and narrower, narrower vernaculars. So a famous example is the so-called Gullah Bible, or the translation of the Bible into Sea Island Creole, a dialect spoken that's often referred to as Gullah. And so you, you see here in this case a Bible produced that has the Gullah translation alongside the traditional rendering of the King James Version. Now in the 21st century with these many, many, many English Bibles, you are seeing the real attempt to reach everyone where he or she is to read the Bible. Much of the history of the English Bible is a history that's told in England. Um, in the pre-Revolutionary War period, it was not allow, or one was not allowed to print an English translation of the Bible uh, in a colony, so the American colonies had no printings of the English Bible in translation. However, in the colonial period, we do find English Psalters printed in America, and we have a number of examples here. Many of these were produced by prominent aristocrats in the colonies at the time who just felt the desire or need to translate the Psalter and then distribute it to their friends. So an example here is a translation of the Psalms by Francis Hopkinson, who was later a signer of the Declaration of Independence, who in 1765 produced his own translation of the Psalms and made a small print run of it that was distributed uh, probably amongst his friends uh, and colleagues. We have here below another famous American, Cotton Mather, who produced his own translation of the Psalms. So you can see at the time in the 18th century, um, prominent English uh, aristocrats uh, in living in the New World were distributing uh, their own personal versions of the Psalter, and we find lots of variations in different types of translations. It's not until after the Revolutionary War, starting in the 1780s, that you have English uh, translations of the full Bible being printed in America. Exhibitions are just part of what you'll find at Pitt's Theology Library. The library also houses special collections and archives. We're here at the Pitts Library in the Chesky Graham Reading Room, which is the home of the special collections of the library. It's in this room that researchers have access to our vast rare book collection, as well as our archival holdings. Our special collections is comprised really of two collections, that is our rare book holdings, uh, as well as our archival collections. Uh, our rare book holdings constitute about a quarter of our total holdings. So the total holdings of the library are about 635,000 volumes. Uh, and the rare books is about 155,000 volumes. Um, our archival collections are really made up of a couple of things. One is archives of major organizations. So for example, the School of Theology, uh, the American Academy of Religion, the Society of Biblical Literature. These are organizations that have placed their repository of archives here so that as they generate new records, those archives live here and are available uh, for researchers to use. In addition to organizational archives, we also hold the papers of prominent scholars, retired pastors, other dignitaries who have come in, uh, into the world of theology and have, have, have left their mark, and therefore their papers and their records are significant sources for ongoing scholarly research. This library in particular focuses really uh, on printed materials, and so that really goes back to the early modern period, uh, and so the, the large uh, bulk of our rare book collection really is from the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. Uh, though, of course, we do hold manuscript items uh, dating earlier than that. It's really the early modern printing uh, that we're kind of known for internationally. 
The Pitts Theology Library dates back to the founding of the Candler School of Theology, 1914. Three years later, the library, which through the 1970s had a different name, moved from a church location to the Emory campus in Atlanta. It relocated again in 2014 to its current location. The 60,000 square feet is uh, comprised of five floors, uh, and each of the floors kind of has its own particular function. Uh, the first floor of the library is the home to our circulating collection, uh, which are the materials that patrons can take from the library. Uh, the second floor is our general kind of research and reading floor, which has most of our study space for our patrons. The third floor uh, is comprised of uh, study space in the form of classrooms, as well as our exhibition gallery and our uh, research carol room. We're here on the fourth floor, which is dedicated completely to our special collections, which is the holdings of our archives and rare books, as well as the reading room uh, that we're in now. And then the fifth floor of the library is staff offices and uh, processing area for cataloging, as well as conference rooms and breaks rooms and really general staff area. Regular library visitors include students, faculty, and staff of the Candler School of Theology. But the Emory community as a whole, of faculty, staff, and students, along with the general public, also have access to the building. One of the projects that I'm, I'm really excited about is actually an audiovisual project. So um, in addition to printed materials, uh, we have large holdings in all kinds of formats, paintings, audiovisual uh, material. Uh, we were fortunate enough to receive a donation of a large collection of audio cassettes documenting Howard Thurman, the middle 20th century, late 20th century uh, theologian, preacher, mystic, um, civil rights leader. Um, and we have recently digitized that entire collection. It's about 41,000 minutes of audio. Um, and then in an attempt to make it as accessible and discoverable as possible, we've actually uh, secured a grant to transcribe the entire collection. So not only do you have the audio to listen to, but you have a full searchable transcription, which allows you to match the transcription to the exact point in the audio. This is a good example of what we try to do in the library, which is to take collections and make them as broadly accessible. This is a collection that's now available up online, but also to allow people to experience um, these collections in a number of ways. Um, Howard Thurman, of course, is now known by many seminary students for his incredible writings, um, but we're excited to allow people to rediscover Thurman in the spoken word, uh, for Thurman himself really thought that was his contribution. And many people in the 1950s and 1960s would have known Thurman through hearing him, and now through the marvels of digital technology, we're, allowed to, we're able to bring that back. The team at Pitt's Theology Library also welcomes the opportunity to share from its special collections, where you'll find reference resources and more. My name is Brandon Watson. I am the curator of archives and manuscripts here at Pitt's Theology Library. I work here in the fourth floor, on the fourth floor in the special collections department. Today I brought out some of our Wesleyana materials. Uh, our Wesleyana collection reflects the period of early Methodism. So beginning with John Wesley, his brother Charles Wesley, other early Methodists in England, as well as tracing Methodism through to um, today. The first item is the diary of John Wesley from when he was here in Georgia. Uh, John Wesley only came to Georgia one time. That was in the year 1736. He was here for uh, about 18 months uh, into 1737. Uh, he wanted to uh, bring some of his practices of, of primitive Christianity that he had developed in, in Oxford with his community there uh, to Georgia to, to try to uh, create a new Christian community among Native Americans. Um, but he was installed as the rector, the, the pastor of the church in Savannah. Savannah was a colonial city, very small at the time that John Wesley arrived. The diary reflects John Wesley's daily life in, uh, in Savannah. It has hour by hour descriptions of his activities. So uh, for instance, uh, he might have a period of private prayer or meeting with people in the church or uh, or working on his uh, learning German. Uh, these are all described in the journal itself. Uh, so you can really pinpoint what John Wesley was doing on any given day. Uh, part of the diary is actually written in a coded uh, shorthand. And so uh, John Wesley, in a sense, was able to conceal uh, some of his activities if someone else were to happen upon his diary. 
Um, that coded shorthand was actually um, not known until um, not the year 1969 when a scholar of early Methodism uh, found a key to interpret it and, and now they're able to translate it. Wasson also shares a letter Wesley wrote in 1738 to his mother following his visit to Georgia. When John Wesley went to Georgia, he uh, met up with uh, a group called the Moravians, and he was on the boat to Georgia with the Moravians. Uh, and they had a very strong impact on his uh, spiritual and theological development. Um, so when he came back to London from Georgia, uh, he met up with uh, an individual named Peter Bowler. Um, and Bowler really coached him and uh, and, and made him see his faith in a different way. And so in May uh, of 1738, John Wesley had a very a powerful religious experience. Uh, that religious experience led him to want to uh, meet with a person named Count Zinzendorf, um, who was uh, the head of the Moravians in Germany. And so one of the letters I brought out describes John Wesley's trip into Germany, um, traveling through uh, Germany down, down the Rhine, um, and actually meeting Peter Bowler's father, and then Count Zinzendorf, the head of the Moravians. Uh, he describes uh, Zinzendorf in very Christ-like terms, and then uh, and the community there is, uh, was really impressing upon him. So he was really impressed by the community there. So the, the letter itself is a letter to his mother, and his mother uh, played a very strong theological, a very strong role in his theological development. Within the special collections area, you'll get to see another unique find tied to Wesley. The pulpit we have here in the special collections reading room uh, was used by John Wesley as he preached to miners in Wales. Um, it was sent over to us um, by an alumnus of Emory College um, in the year 1886. So it, it predates the School of Theology, but it was part of Emory College. And before you even make it into the Special Collections Reading Room, you may spot Wesley himself, that is, a likeness of the theologian, just before his death. As you're approaching the Special Collections Reading Room on the fourth floor, you'll notice in the hallway there's a oil painting of John Wesley, a profile uh, portrayal of him dated to around the year 1790 by Henry Edridge. Um, the, this would have been um, painted in his life in the year uh, before he died in, in 1791, we think. We are one of the most substantive collections of theological materials in North America. Pitt's Theology Library has one of the largest collections of theological materials, according to Adams, in part because of the partnerships the library has secured. One is we work really hard to partner with other libraries through systems like interlibrary loan and consortial lending agreements so that our patrons here are not limited by our physical holdings. Um, as one of the larger libraries in the country, of course, we do, we tend to lend out a lot more materials than we borrow, but we really try not to limit our patrons to what we physically hold here. The digital age, of course, has brought all kinds of new forms of access. Um, and so I think what's really incumbent upon libraries in the 21st century is to see themselves less as silos of large collections and more as kind of nodal points to bring people together. So I'll give you an, an example of this um, that my colleague Brandon and I have been working on. We hold large, uh, a large collection of manuscript letters written by John and Charles Wesley. Well, there are about five or six other libraries in North America that also have large collections of manuscript letters from John and Charles Wesley. Instead of just holding on to our letters, why not work with those other institutions to create an online repository where one person can go and see all of these letters virtually brought together as a collection. So I think in the future, while libraries need to work hard to build their own collections, and we certainly continue to do that, um, there's a real onus on libraries to kind of bring people together and bring collections together so that we can all mutually benefit from what these incredible institutions hold.
Collaboration also is at play when it comes to the building's library space in general. The vision of building this library uh, five years ago was, was to move away from, or to, to move away from, I guess, the, the kind of quiet, austere reading room and to view libraries as more of a collaborative workspace that incorporates digital technologies, that incorporates small group study rooms. So really a vision of a library is space um, that allows people to engage these collections in a kind of social and collaborative way. Um, and so while we, we think of this as a very quiet library and we still keep people quiet when they're working here, um, there's a lot of unique spaces and this reading room is one of them that allow people to work together. So the reading room itself now is set up for individual researchers. You can see there are six desks in here. Um, but these tables move around and we've often combined them into a large seminar uh, space. And so classes from the School of Theology or for other units of Emory can come here to work together kind of in a space, but also to engage the collection. So this is really, I think, when we, we are at our best and we, we do our best is to allow the collections to play a role in learning, uh, whether that's you know, here in a classroom space for students at the School of Theology, or if that's online through digital exhibitions, the ability to kind of bring these collections to life. One of those collections is cause for celebration for Adams. Another thing that we're known for internationally is uh, our Richard C. Kessler Reformation Collection, uh, which is really the flagship collection. And outside of Germany, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a better collection of materials related to Martin Luther and the reformations that began in the early 16th century in Germany. Uh, a few prize items within that collection that we're known for internationally would include the so-called September Testament, which is the first edition of Martin Luther's translation of the New Testament um, from Greek into German, a significant text not only as a Bible, but also as a kind of beginnings of a modern German language. Also within that collection are some early Lutheran hymnals, um, documentation of the fact that the Lutheran tradition from its beginning was a hymn singing tradition, which is very different than some other of the uh, reforming traditions as Luther himself was a hymn writer. Hymns, as Adams reveals, had a part two in Bible translations. So one of the major influences on the development of the English translation of the Bible, particularly the translation of the Psalms, was the use of the text liturgically in church. That is, the Bible was not simply read, but it was often sung. What we have here is displays of materials from the famous English hymn writer, theologian, and minister Isaac Watts, who in the early 18th century became famous for his translations of the Psalms. Watts' psalms were so influential that they eventually became some of the most beloved hymns of the church. We might think of a hymn like Joy to the World, which is a hymn creation of Watts, but is in many ways a translation of the psalms as well. This case includes uh, not only some of uh, Watts' significant translation of the psalms, but some personal copies that were owned by Watts. So this text here, for example, is a 1719 printing of Watts' translation of the Psalms. And here on the opening, we have an inscription in the hand of Watts that reads, To Mrs. Hartop, signed Isaac Watts. And we know that Mrs. Hartop and her husband uh, were early supporters and friends of Watts and actually were responsible for getting him his first job in music. So here we have a nice personal connection of the great hymn writer and translator Watts here dedicating his book to one of his uh, early patrons. The library's word-for-word, -word, sense for sense exhibition includes a display relating to a translation of Psalms. One of the challenges in translating the Bible, and particularly translating the Psalms, is the desire to remain faithful to the original, in this case Hebrew text, but also to produce a translation that reads nicely, or in the case of the Psalms, sings nicely. Uh, in this 1612 uh, Psalter, we have a great example of that. This is what's known as the Ainsworth Psalter because it was translated by a um, Henry Ainsworth. And Ainsworth recognized this challenge of both remaining faithful but also producing what we might think of as a metrical psalm, a psalm that seems, uh, sings quite well. And so what Ainsworth does here is produce the psalms in two parallel columns. On the one side, you have the very wooden, literal, faithful to the Hebrew psalm. And on the other side, you have his metrical psalm, which is a song that is maybe looser in its translation form, but is more easily sung by a congregation. Ainsworth Psalter is quite significant in our American context because this book, produced in 1612, was the Psalter that the pilgrims brought with them in 1620 when they sailed from Amsterdam, where Ainsworth was, to uh, New England uh, and settled here. So this became the Psalter of the pilgrims in their first settlement here uh, in America. 
generations to come will benefit from having access to such records, and that's largely because of the library's preservation methods. I think as, as a major academic library, we have a number of responsibilities. And at the forefront of our mind, particularly as a rare book library, is the preservation of materials for future generations to have access to. Um, it's incumbent upon us as, as those who are fortunate to have the resources to collect these materials to protect them so that they can survive. So you take a 500 year old book and we work to make sure that it's available for the next 500 years. But beyond simply preservation, we recognize that the digital age affords us all kinds of opportunities to preserve but also to make accessible these materials. And so we work very hard to take advantage of technologies that not only allow us to digitize and put these things up online, but also allow us to gather a community of scholars that can help people really understand what they're looking at. So for example, it's one thing to take a 16th century German book and scan it and put it online for everyone to see. It's quite another thing to accumulate a group of scholars who can annotate that text for the general public and let them know what they're reading, translate it for them, and provide some context to it. So as a library, we see preservation not merely as making sure that the object continues to exist, which of course we work hard to do, but also preserving the impact that, that item may have had 500 years ago. And fortunately, we live in an age where the technologies allow us to do that, and so we work very hard to make sure that people have access in as full a sense of that word as we can uh, possibly understand it. I would say we're, we're not nearly where we need to be. Um, and that's because on the one hand, you could just scan lots of books, but that doesn't, we try to do it in a much more deliberate way. So what we try to do is pair scanning and making available materials with good proper metadata, discoverability, and long-term preservation plans. So we wanna make sure that when we put something up online, first of all, you're able to find it, Second of all, you're able to read it or view it in an accessible way. And third, that the item that is the digital surrogate itself will continue to exist for generations to come. So there is a kind of preservation need that also accompanies the digital. So in terms of where we are, no, most of our rare book collection, most of our archival holdings are not available online. It's something that we're, we're working really hard to remedy, but we wanna make sure that we do that in a careful and sustainable way so that these materials continue to be available. Safeguarding the past, it all adds up to an investment in the future. Thanks for watching. Go to aibtv.com forward slash donate to support programming like this. Your contributions may be tax deductible.